is 10 o'clock. We are formally starting our program. Thanks everyone who is here. I'm Julie Irvin Hartman. I am a certified proposal manager joined with my co-presenter today. Hi, I'm Susan Rapkin. I'm the owner of SMR Business Services. And we are thrilled and excited once again to be presenters with our dear, dear friends um, at the Houston Independent School District. And today's session is going to discuss how to get your house in order to grow your business with HISD. We are joined by our sponsor today with RFP, RFP School Watch, and they'll tell you a little bit about themselves here in a minute or so. But first, we're going to turn it over to Yesenia and her team with the Houston Independent School District. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to have so many people register. Um, and thank you to our presenters, both Susan and Julie, who are experts in their fields. You are very lucky to be here today. They have great information, great knowledge. So we're very excited to have them. Um, and we're very excited that you know, you've taken the first step to make sure that you're able to grow your business, learn all the great information that they have to share. And also a um, great thank you to RFP Schools Watch for being the sponsor of this particular event. And then I also just want to uh, make everybody aware that my two colleagues are also on this call and at this workshop. So Jermaine Baines is one of our specialists, and then Tan Nguyen is also our specialist. Um, we all work together to verify the MWB documentation, and we work very closely with purchasing services. Um, so with no further ado, uh, Julie and Susan, I'm going to kick it back to you guys, and thank you again for hosting us, and I look forward to um, hearing all of the great information that you all have to share this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And our session sponsor today is RFP School Watch. And we have Keith, Gary, as well as Renee with RFP School Watch. And they're going to tell you a little bit more about the services that they provide. Well, thank you all for attending. This is Gary Slattery. I am CEO, president of RFP School Watch. Our corporate name is Education Intelligence Inc. Uh, we are a 20 year old company, have been monitoring all uh, school districts, colleges, universities, government agencies for the last 20 years for our clients. So we become your eyes and ears. We are a service uh, firm and have a very large team of data miners who uh, pull down bids every night. We send out around 10,000 bids a day to our uh, clients. And um, it is a a uh, much easier way for them to get the information to see what is being released in terms of RFPs, RFIs, RFQs, ITBs, the whole set of uh, RFSX uh, procurement opportunities. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to be partners uh, with Julie and Susan. Uh, and uh, if anyone has any questions, you can just reach out to us. Uh, We'd love to be able to share more about what we do for our clients. And uh, we, uh, we make it easier for you to find uh, bid opportunities in every industry. Uh, we have over a thousand different categories that we put our bids in and uh, publish them daily. And you will see them daily uh, specific to the industry you're in. So again, thank you and uh, it's our uh, privileged to be a sponsor uh, for this session. Great, and thank you so, so much, Gary. Any other additional comments, Renee, that you'd like to make? Oh, um, well, I'm Renee Farias. I'm actually very, very familiar with HISD. I've uh, done some business with them. And uh, as far as RFP School Watch is concerned, it's really, as you probably know, if you are a small business, it's very difficult. There are so many different opportunities from so many different organizations all over Texas, all over the US, whether it be federal, state, schools, um, all of it. And being able to you know, have your eyes on all of that is a full-time job in itself. So that's really what we do. We, get, we work with you to figure out exactly what kind of jobs you're looking for, what kind of opportunities you're looking for, and send those 
bid pro those uh, bid announcements directly to your email so that you're not having to monitor all of those on your own. Um, and you can get those either just for a state or just for a few states or the entire nation. We also cover Canada. So um, yeah, depending on how much you want to grow, we're here to help out. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, so Julie and I are going to be switching off today. Um, when I am in front of the camera, Julie's monitoring the chat. When we switch, you'll see me on the chat. Um, she is going to drop the RFP School Watch uh, website into the chat now. Uh, we want you to continue to ask questions in the chat. That's how we're going to keep this very interactive. Um, if you haven't done so, please put your contact information, a little bit about your company, your name, the services that you provide. Um, and I've noticed that several people are putting in there whether they are registered as an HISD vendor. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. So it takes integrity to have a business. So integrity is the practice of being honest and showing a consistent and uncompromising adherence to strong moral and ethical principles and values. You can't be a person of your word when everything is chaotic, so you need to have your house in order. This kind of, this kind of ties in with our theme today. We are looking at the end of third quarter. Fourth quarter is right in front of us, sipping on a pumpkin spice latte, um, as well as the end of the year. And this is the time of year to look at what you've accomplished in 2021 and start putting together your goals for 2022. In order to meet those goals, the house has to be in order. So it takes, it takes grip to run a business. The last 18 months, it's taken a lot of grit to run a business. You've had to pivot your business. You've had to offer additional services, remove services. You had to really take a look at your financials to see if you were going to survive the pandemic. But some days it takes grit just to show up and get the job done. So our session today is going to help prepare you for HISD contracts. It's going to set some of the foundation and network to ensure your success. And it's gonna look at some of the mistakes to avoid that kind of cost that time and money, and time is money. It's not gonna cover everything that you need to do in order to have a successful business. And as a final disclaimer, this does not guarantee an HISD contract. So what you can expect from us? Well, we want to have a engaging webinar experience. We want you to, uh, we want to provide you with tools that you can immediately use. We're going to have plenty of time for questions, both in the chat, and we'll unmute mute some, um, we'll have some, some verbal question time during the, the presentation as well as the end. And what we expect from you, we want you to listen. And we want you to participate. When we ask a question and we want some answers in the chat, provide us some feedback. That's going to help us um, as we move through the presentation. We want you to actually put together some action steps and then start working on those action steps in the next couple of weeks. There'll be a link to a survey. We need your feedback. This is how we uh, improve upon our presentations. But we also want to hear and celebrate your successes as you move through those action steps. So our agenda about get, growing your getting your house in order is we're going to kind of go over um, on a high level some financial statements, risk management, 
marketing and research, and your path forward. So I mentioned action plan. Everybody grab a pen, paper, open up a Word document on the other one of the one of the other screens that you have open at the moment. Um, take your phone out, write some notes in it. So what are you going to get done this week out of what we cover? This month? Um, as well as the last quarter of this year. The end of the year will be here before you know it. So here's some information about Julie and what makes her um, a great person to be presenting today. As you can see, she has had an incredible success with a, her former business as well as her current one. Um, so this is just some information, just give you an idea of who Julie is. We will be dropping in our um, contact information in the chat. Now it is time to switch. So my co-presenter, Susan, is one of my most favorite people on the planet. And for as long as I've known her, her whole heart has been dedicated to helping small businesses grow. Susan was actually the one who certified my company when I owned it and helped me grow through my certification and getting government contracts. And not only that, then she helped me grow my business. Then I sold my former business and we're still here together um, on our next adventure. When she's not here doing webinars with me, she's being a grandma and making a pancake breakfast. So we're gonna go ahead and here's our contact information for us. There's mine and there's Susan's. We really encourage you to connect with us on social media. It's where we post videos, helpful hints, as well as upcoming um, trainings. That's a few of uh, a little bit about us. So you've met people with Houston Independent School District. You've met the team at RFP School Watch. Well, there are some other players and teams in this game of government contracting. So we're going to do a little bit of definition in regarding two major players that we're going to talk about, which are prime contractors and subs. So HISD is the agency, right? They are the owner of the contract. Then you've got the prime contractor. This is the person who won the contract. This is the person who is responsible for communicating with Houston Independent School District. This is the person who's responsible for sending the invoices. This is the person who's responsible for making the whole project a success, right? So that could be a construction company such as Manhattan. That could be um, a large consulting firm. So you've got the prime. That is also the person who submitted the RFP, the response. They were the one who took the lead. Then you've got a subcontractor. These are the companies that support the prime. Many instances, the prime doesn't do all of the work. HISD has small business goals. So the prime contractor has to go find these subcontractors. They want small businesses. They need small businesses. That's what Eusinia and her entire team do is to make sure that HISD hits their goals and gets as many subcontractors involved in the projects as possible. So that's the definition. How do we put that into practice? All right, well, let's think about renovating a classroom, right? So we're gonna renovate quite a few classrooms and we need a general contractor or the project manager. That would be the prime contractor. That's the person who's gonna be in charge of everything, all of the coordination, all of the project management. Well, in that classroom, I'm gonna need some painting and sheetrock, I'm gonna need some electrical and I'm gonna need some HVAC. So those would be three different subcontractors who have very different scopes of work that are gonna all work together to make sure that this project is a success. So the subcontractors will send their invoice to the prime. The prime will send one invoice to the Houston Independent School District. So that is a very, very basic, basic example of the relationship between a prime contractor and a subcontractor. 
And what's great is every single person here on this call has opportunities with HISD, either as a subcontractor or a prime. And I grew my business. I had it for 17 years through government contracts. And I started out as a subcontractor. And here's a little secret as a subcontractor, the checks as a prime and a subcontractor, they cash the same way. It's money in your bank account. So as a small business in growing with the Houston Independent School District and growing through the opportunities that you're gonna find on RFP School Watch, you're gonna learn the process and how better to learn the process on small little jobs than big jobs that are high risk, high exposure. So take a hold of all of those opportunities as a subcontractor, learn the ropes, get the experience, and then you can continue to grow as a prime. Speaking of prime contractors, here is a list, and we will send this to you um, in our follow-up email. Here is a list of all, I'm sorry, not all of them, quite a few of HISD's prime contractors. And, and these primarily are in, in construction. Um, but we're going to send this, this list of, of quite a few of HISD's primes um, to you. Our first section that we're going to talk about today in getting your house in order is your financials. And I like to think of, of the little uh, Unikitty from um, the, the Lego movie. You know, she's like, numbers, 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 numbers. And she loves um, numbers. And so do I. And so... As you grow your business and as you get your house in order and as you mature, your finances and the people involved in your financials um, might change, right? So when you started out, it might just be you, right? You're going to be doing your books on the weekends or, or, or I knew a girl who was 27 and she used to do her books on Wednesday nights, right? She had curly hair. So you might be doing that as well, right? You're selling during the day and your bookkeeping at night, right? Raise your hand if there are some of you out there doing that. Absolutely. Well, as you grow and you progress, then you might hire a bookkeeper, whether that's a contract bookkeeper, um, an in-house bookkeeper, a part-time bookkeeper, a remote bookkeeper, those types of things. So what does that bookkeeper do? So a bookkeeper puts in your bills, it puts in, they put in the transactions on either a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, depending on, you know, how quickly you, you turn. So lots of in, in, in QuickBooks is, is one of the most common platforms, right? An accountant is a little different than a bookkeeper. And at first glance, they might seem the same, but it's much more complex and analytical. So an accountant analyzes the financial data and offers projections and advice on financial elements that affect your overall company's growth. So this is where you're actually looking at the reports and you're analyzing and you're making decisions based on data and based on the goals that you've set uh, for your company. Obviously a CPA, right? Um, quite a bit step up from the accountant. Um, they're credible. You might visit your CPA once a year to do your taxes. I encourage you to, to meet them more often. Um, depending on how your budget allows. Um, but a CPA is, you know, more credible. They've got more expertise and, and they can help you reach your overall financial goals. And then obviously, once you grow super big time, um, you might have a controller or a CFO or at certain points in time in your business life cycle, you might have a, a fractional CFO or a fractional controller come in and, and help you um, if you're looking to, to sell your business. All righty, a banker. Every single small business needs a banker, right? And, and what I'm talking about is I'm talking about getting your house in order and I'm talking about a relationship with the banker. All right, driving up to the teller or dropping your uh, checks in the tube or mobile deposits is not a relationship with the banker. If you have a 1-800 number, that's not a relationship with the banker. Part of getting your house in order and getting ready to do business with the Houston Independent School District and getting ready for when you find those opportunities at RFP School Watch is having that relationship with a banker. That means having that line of credit ready, 
knowing how much, if and when you need it alone, do you qualify for? Who can you call? Um, if you need um, information on a banker, but Susan and I know there's a couple different bankers that we know that that really are dedicated to small businesses and understand the government space and understand uh, the types of funding that are needed and necessary to grow your business in this space. But once again, you've got to have a banker on speed dial. All righty. If you don't, um, let us know. If you don't, then put that on your action item, maybe for next week. Call call whatever financial institution that you bank with and say, look, I want to grow my business. I need to talk to a business banker. Some, some small businesses, the last time that they talked to a business banker or even anybody at their bank was when they went to go set up their account. That's been way too long. It's overdue. So why am I going on and on and on and on and on about your financials? Well, because HISD requires them. They require financial information for the last two years. So when that opportunity comes up that you've been waiting for with the Houston Independent School District and you don't have your financials ready to go, womp, womp, you just missed out on that opportunity. So you've got to be able to have your financials in, ready to go. That's your profit and loss statement. That's your balance sheet. And that's your statement of cash flow, right? So then you might be thinking, well, Julie, I'm not going to be a prime, right? I'm not going to be the one submitting. Well, why would I need them? Well, uh, you, I'm glad you asked that question because here is an example of one of our dear friends at Telepson, and this is their subcontractor packet. Right there on page three of seven, financial information. They want to know your assets. They want to know your liabilities. They want to know your bank information. It goes there. So regardless of what role you play, remember the, that team and those players, you've got to have your financial information in order. You've got to know your numbers. All righty. So that's why you need your banker information. And that's why financials are so critical, um, regardless of the role. So reports, I touched a little bit on the reports, right? The balance sheet, the statement of cash flow and um, your profit and loss. So the SBA, about those three reports, the success rate of your business, of any business that does three things, they produce them, they review them and they analyze them. So you've got to do all three of these things. If you do it annually, your success rate is only 25 to 35%. So when I think of that in terms of annually, that means I'm looking in the rears, I'm looking at my fan financial reports after my CPA does my taxes, right? Well, I'm in the rear view mirror. That was a year ago. Think about a year ago in 2020. And then it, it, here's the big catch. Think of the difference between a year ago from 2020 to 2019 huge difference, right? So you've got to look at them more currently. So if you look at your financials monthly, because when you do that monthly, you're more familiar with your numbers, you can keep a pulse and you're able to adjust in the word that I know is so overused right now is pivot. But, but truly, I mean, think about how quickly our worlds have changed every single month. But even better, if you carve out just 30 minutes on Friday afternoons or Wednesday nights, pick, pick a time, make an appointment with yourself to look at your financials weekly. That means you are making your numbers a priority and you're dedicated to that. So, so you're working on the business, not in it. Your success rate increases 95%. 95%. I go to Vegas on those odds any day. Right. And now you're able to, to talk about your numbers. We want you to be successful. That's why we're all here today. Another reason why you want and need your financials right now alone. We already talked about that. Right. A business assistance loan, an emergency loan, increasing your line of credit. A certification and recertifications. Right. HISD accepts a couple certifications. So you're going to want to go and get those as well. We already talked about prime contractors needing your financial information. Well, 
rates are still pretty low. So if you want to refi your mortgage or if you're one of the, the people that, that need to buy a house right now, as a business owner, they're going to want your business financials. All righty. And then as well as for bonding and insurance, when you go to get a bond and Susan's going to talk about that, or when you go to get your company insured and the different types of insurance that you need, depending on the services that you provide, they're going to ask for your financials already. And you're, when they ask for them, your response should be, I'll get those right over to you via email. Not hold on. Let me call my CPA. Let me see if they can get back to me sometime this week, this month, or this quarter, right? Talk about windows of opportunity. They close immediately. So if you don't already have your financials somewhere on your computer, somewhere on your Google Drive, somewhere on a server that you can quickly access, go ahead and put that on one of your action items. Your financial statements, balance sheet, profit and loss, statement of cash flow. So what is a balance sheet? It tells you what the company owes and how much shareholders have invested. This isn't going to be a um, financial accounting course. This is just kind of overall. Balance sheet has, has uh, two parts. You've got your assets and your liabilities. And here's the funny thing about the balance sheet. It's got a balance. So if your assets and your total liabilities and equity don't balance, well, that's when you talk to your accountant and that's when you talk to your bookkeeper. Already, your profit and loss, um, or also is called an income statement because it clearly states if you're making a profit. All righty. And so this says if we're going up, we're going down, right? It's revenue minus expenses equals profit. How much money am I, am I doing here? And, and you can look at your PL year over year. You can look at it as a percentage change. But once again, if you don't have this, in some sort of financial software, you're not going to be able to get a pulse of your of your company. You can look at it um, throughout the year. You can look at it year over year, those types of things. Our final report that makes up our financials is our statement of cash flow. And what's great about the statement of cash flow is it pulls in numbers from the net income, right? So it pulls in your net income from your PL. It talks about cash flow, right? How much money came in, how much money came out. And then most importantly, it's how much money is at the end of the period, right? And so you've got to be able to look at all three of these and know what story each one of them tells and what specific period of time each one of them is is referencing to, but in the statement of cash flow, how much cash is available? Cash is king. So there it says cash at the end of the period. This is like the gas gauge in your car, right? If we're good or if we're going and, and if that, that fuel light came on, right? Then you better find a gas station quick, right? So if that negative, if it's negative, then you've got to change very quickly and, and adjust accordingly. So once you start getting um, all of your financials in order and you can start taking maybe even a deeper dive on profit break even and loss in terms of each client, in terms of each job, or in terms of each um, service line within your company. And I saw Susan was super fast going over questions in the chat. Um, and so we'll switch right now. And Susan's going to come and talk about her favorite favorite financial budgets? All right, I am one of those really strange people that love budgeting. Um, it comes from the nonprofit world uh, where you had to have a budget, you had to, to operate by that budget um, and every event, et cetera, had a budget. So one of the first things that I look at when doing anything is, is profit and loss, what's it going to cost? Um, and so you need a, your company needs a budget. I was a little surprised when I went out and interviewed small businesses in my past life, um, about a hundred a year, and how many of them did not have a budget? Um, so if you haven't been putting a budget together, this is a great year to do that. Um, we're ending up this year. Go ahead and start working on your 20, 
22 budget. It's a verb. It is constantly changing. It needs to be updated. Um, it's telling you where your money is coming from, but also telling um, your money where you want it to go. So trying to run a budget, trying to run a business without a budget is like walking through an intersection, eyes closed, fingers in your ears, can't hear, or in my case, hearing aids out. Um, you can't see, you can't hear, you don't know where you're going. So it it's it's can look complicated, but it's not. It's a pretty simple process. And your first budget may not be as on point as you want, but that's okay. It's a start and you can improve upon it each year. So one of the first things you wanna do is plan some time. You are not going to create a really strong budget in a couple hours. This is a really good time for you to do a planning session of where you want your company to go. It's a really good time to do a look back of where your company has been, not only this year, but last year and the year before. And it's probably going to be significantly different from 29 to 2020 to 2021. It's time to look at some assumptions of what you think you're going to do next year. And maybe it's even time to do some staff evaluations and sit down and have a conversation with those business development or those that are handling the sales of what they think they can do for next year. So as you can see, this is not a two hour process. This is a process that's gonna take a couple of days, but just start by looking at what you've done in 2021 and 2020. Pull that information out of your financial software. Most softwares that I have seen will export that information into an Excel file where you can simply look at those numbers and make those assumptions. Start with your, um, start with your expenses. Call your um, insurance agent. Look at your lease. Uh, what's your um, rental amount going to be next year? Put all of that in first and then start looking at where the money's going to come from. So let's say for an assumption that you are going to be a million dollar company next year. We're going to hit that million dollars. So what's it going to take on income? So million dollars is my yearly goal. My monthly goal is going to be need to be 83,000. Our weekly goal is going to be 20,000 and that's at 50 weeks because well the week of Thanksgiving and the week of Christmas don't count unless you have holiday sales. And then your daily goal. At the end of every day, I need to have brought in $5,000 in revenue. Now for my company, it's just me. That's not really a realistic number. Like it would be hard to sell $5,000 and do $5,000 worth of work. So maybe that's not the number I need to hit, but you can look at this and you know start lowering it down and say, okay, where's my company gonna be? Do your expenses. Include a salary for the owner. If you don't budget, you will never pay yourself. So do that. Look at your group insurance. Look at your rent. Look at your copy machine um, rental. Uh, look at your uh, other information. Maybe you have vehicles and you have you know loans for those. Put all of that information first. When you do start doing your revenue, what is your recurring revenue? Should we call that that mailbox money? 
that money that's going to come in every month because of a contract, because of some residual, um, maybe you have on retainer for a company. Uh, so what is that revenue? Um, with a marketing company, that may be your website hosting. So start putting all of that together and start looking at trends. And August is never, you know, has never been a good month for me. Well, then you're going to look, kind of try and um, look at your budget and say, okay, you know, August may not be a good month for sales, but July and September have been pretty good. So kind of play around with that. Um, maybe most of your money comes in at the end of the, the year. Well, you need to save some of that money for the beginning of next year. All right, so we've put our budget together. And while we're looking at that, we're going to look at some of the risk management. Some of this information we might need to be updating um, the cost because we have decided in our 2022 goals that we are going to increase our business and we are going to get an HISD contract. So we need to look at our risk management and say, am I ready to do business with HISD? So HISD on their website, and Julie's going to drop this on in the chat, is talks about the risk management. There are things that the school district needs you to have in place before you do business with them. So we're going to go over a few of those. So here's the contact information for the risk management. So the first one is a safety plan. So whether you're doing business directly with um, HISD, whether you are part of a co-op, whether you are doing business with other school districts or some of these large prime <clears throat> contractors, safety plans. If you're going to be on the school, they want you to, you know, campus, they want you to be safe. So do you have a plan? Do you have a manual? And are you using that manual? Do you provide training to your employees to ensure they are acting in a safe manner? And do you do safety training on a regular or even daily basis, whether that's a safety moment, a toolbox talk, a tailgate moment, 60 seconds of safety, something to make sure that you have um, some sort of safety, ongoing safety training. And maybe you need to have a safety person on site. Um, I know that Manhattan requires that there be an OSHA, at least an OSHA 10 person on site for every subcontractor. Um, so that they, they can ensure that that person is watching everyone to make sure that they have on their hat, their boots, their safety goggles. And then you also need to go ahead and pull your e EMR or OSHA report so that you know where your company stands as far as your numbers. Um, this is a subcontractor qualification for Harvey. Um, and as you can see, they ask about your safety. And Julie's going to drop the link into the chat for Harvey. So if you have a really strong EMR, then that's a great uh, marketing tool for you, and if you're especially in that construction industry. But keep in mind, even if it's not construction, you need to have some sort of safety plan, not as, as intense as construction, if you're going to be on an HISD campus. Especially if that campus is undergoing any construction. You can get injured in an office just as as well as injured on a job site. So here is an example of an EMR letter. 
or an Iman letter. So basically, this is a letter from um, talking about your safety record. And so you want to keep that as low as possible. Most um, general contractors, as well as HISD, are going to want a three-year history. So now well, let's talk about bonding. So that's another risk management. So a bond is a guarantee. Um, HISD requires a payment bond from their prime contractors. This ensures, guarantees that their workers, their subcontractors, and the suppliers will be paid. So that's very important if you are a subcontractor. You want to make sure that if you're subcontracting um, on a HISD project, that when the prime gets paid, they will pay the subcontractors. So if you're going to be doing any type of construction on an HISD project, um, if, if you're subcontracting now, then you probably will not need to be bonded. But if you're ready to grow in 2022, oh, that sounds so far away, um, then you need to look into what is it gonna take to have my company bonded? and start that conversation and relationship with a bonding company. Um, so performance and payment bonds may be required. A payment bond is required for any project, $25,000 or greater. So now let's talk about contracts. It's written in the contract that you should have um, a, a bond. It is written in the contract that you should pay subcontractors. All right, so we're not gonna mute everyone today, but I do want you to do this with me, subcontractors. I need you to repeat after me. We're going to make this statement together. As a subcontractor, I will not. I will not. Enter into any. Any verbal agreements. Any verbal <laughs> agreement. There is nothing. Yeah. We are not a handshake society any longer. We would like to be, but we're not. Um, the last thing you want to do is be chasing your money because you have no written documentation. And by chasing your money, I mean driving all the way across Houston and in the Staples parking lot, waiting on somebody to bring you a cashier's check. Don't do that. You want to know how you're going to get paid. You want to know what you need to do um, and you don't want to find out after you've already started the work. You need a written subcontractor's agreement that both of you have signed. So here is um, also if you're prime, you also need, well, actually if you're prime or sub, you need to read the HISD general terms and conditions. This outlines how the prime gets paid, it outlines the entire uh, way that the contract is going to work. Discussed. So if you- So you both can move on in a healthy way and have a healthy relationship. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's say that um, 
if Prime reaches out to you, whether it's construction or professional services or um, just somebody needing some, some supplies, um, and they want you to you know, give your number, they're going to submit their bid. <clears throat> you need to read over the general terms and conditions. I mean, if you're not going to get paid for 60 to 90 days, this is information you need to know ahead of time. Any contract, any contract, subcontractor contract, HISD contract, read. Then read, reread, highlight, ask questions, talk to an attorney that specializes in contracts in your industry. There are attorneys that specialize in construction contracts and professional service contracts. They need to understand your industry in order to help you understand the contract. Well, now a lot of people just like to sign the contract. I have a contract with HISD and sign it. You need to understand your obligations and how they get invoiced and every, every single piece of it so that you don't violate the contract that you've just signed. Um, so this contract provides you, it sort of manages those in expectations from both parties. You understand either HISD or the Prime's uh, responsibilities, and you understand what your responsibilities are. And that's why there's no dispute. And at the end of the day, if there is a dispute, it, it also explains how you um, mediate that dispute. So when you're having somebody read a contract, it's not your friend, your cousin, or the young lady that's at your front desk, or even a law student. Patience. Don't just, people get so excited. They just sign. No. Take the time to understand the contract. Um, look at the scope of work, look at the payment terms, look at the uh, retainage of the retainage, look at the default, um, how can they terminate the contract, um, is there going to be any liens, is there any insurance needed, all of that information so that you have all your ducks in a row, you sign the contract, and you're ready to hit the ground. All right. Our last, well, I think that's our last risk management is insurance. HISD requires that you have the insurance now, not upon award. Um, and you can use a letter from your insurance company. You need to know what insurance requirements are from HISD so that you can you know, be assured that your insurance coverage is going to be adequate for this contract. It is part of the documentation that you must submit, is that you must submit either your insurance verification or a letter. So let's look at the certificate of liability insurance. It has all of your insurance on there. Um, they, you should have a PDF of this. If not, you can go back to your insurance company and say, hey, I need a certificate of liability insurance in order to submit with RFPs and RFQs. Understand the document, the RFP. Make sure that your insurance, not only your coverage, but the types of insurance that you have. If you're going to be on an HISD campus, you must have automobile insurance and must be able to prove that. You're on their campus, they're in your parking lot. Um, and we are seeing more and more um, with different entities asking for cyber liability. You, are, you have our data on your system. We want to ensure that 
our data on your system is secure. And so they require the cyber liability. All right. And when you are filling out your subcontractor registration, up oh, right there. Do you have insurance? Please submit. All right, any questions before we do a switch? Whew, you've been busy over there, Julie. I have been busy, you're right. And I am going to try to see if we can start the video again. Awesome, it's back, yes. No, you can see us. No, no, not quite sure what is 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 going on here. They can see the slides. What they can see the on? slides. That's that's the most important, right? Is is to see the slides and just to hear our voice. Um, and and I put it in the chat, but I'll reiterate it as well. This entire session is going to be recorded. Um, give us a, a couple days, I think about a week or so, and and we're going to. Um, post it on um, YouTube and you'll get the, the entire link to everything. So you'll be able to fast forward. We're also going to chapter the video. So if there's a specific section uh, that you want to go back to, you can do that as well. Also in the chat, uh, we were going kind of back and forth about blocking out time, you know, on your Fridays to work on your business. I mean, work, yeah, on your business, not in it. And, and I want to pause and and talk about um, you know I encourage you maybe maybe not this Friday uh, and maybe it's the Friday after Labor Day or whatever but pick a Friday pick 15 minutes in your action plan to go back through the video whether that's the stuff on the financials maybe that's the stuff on risk management that Susan talked about but make an appointment with yourself block out that 15 minutes. Um, because if you put it on your calendar, it's more likely to happen than if you put it on that little bitty post-it note with, with everything else that you need to do, right? Susan loves talking about, talking about budgets. I love talking about marketing. And in this government space, if you're going to do work with any government entity, there is one thing um, that tells your story, and it's your capability statement. And and pausing here and kind of going back to thinking about your business as a whole, right? So you've got a business plan, you've got a business model, and you've got your business focus, right? So on your Fridays, maybe you look at these, maybe you look at these once once a quarter or whatever. So you've got these, these three pillars, right? And, and each one of them has a role for your success. But what a capability statement does in this space is it tells your story. So it takes elements from your business plan. It takes elements from your business model. It takes elements of, of your focus areas. It tells the story on this one page document. It's concise and it's compelling. And Houston Independent School District, the entire supplier diversity team um, is going to ask for this. So if you email them, after this session and say, hey, I want to do work with HISD, they're going to say, hey, I need a capability statement because they take that and they look at your capability statement and they see which buyer and which person or where you are a good fit within the organization. Without that, they don't know where to direct you. So we're going to spend some time and talk about a capability statement. And a capability statement has a couple of components um, regarding how, how it all comes together. And so these puzzle pieces are going to be um, kind of our navigation tools for, for the content um, within this section. So you've got your identity, right? That is your company's identity. Remember, this is your company's one-page resume. You've got your services. These are the products and services that your company provides. Things about your operations, the why you. There needs to be a compelling statement of why Houston Independent School District should choose your company. And then experience, right? So that's your clients and your projects. They don't want a big fancy brochure, right? Um, plus those are expensive. And, and, and back, back in the day, back in you know, 2019, you know, we used to have pocket folders and inserts. And one thing that'll infuriate anyone in the government space to say, well, just go to my website and learn about my company. 
that's not how things work here, right? Um, and it also helps them when you when they see your capability statement and they see which certifications you have, that helps them meet their goals. It helps them meet their MWBE goals. So if you have your certifications that Houston Independent School District accepts, and we're gonna talk about those, and you give them their one page capability statement, which is your company's resume, you're making their job easier. And who, who wants to do business with people who makes their job easier? Me, me, right? So think about your end customer. Your end customer is HISD. Your end customer is a prime. Do whatever you can do to make their job easier. Give them extra reasons to choose you, right? Because you can follow instructions. That's a good one. Let's start there. All righty. Capability statement. So those are the big puzzle pieces. So here's kind of all the granular details and how the, the, the nits and bits all fit together, right? So you've got your value proposition, your DUNS number, NAICS codes, NIGP codes, references. And because you're here today, um, we're offering a $50 coupon for capability statements. So if anybody wants us to either review your capability statement or if you don't have one, um, we can help you out. But it's funny when, when people send Susan and I our capabilities, their capability statements and say, oh, I have one. It's, it's great. The one thing the majority of people are missing on their capability statement is contact information. A website is not contact information. I want a human. I want a phone number that the human actually answers the phone and their voicemail is not full. And I want an email address to email said human, okay? A website is not a human. That is not contact information. All righty, so why a capability statement? What are the benefits? Well, it's pretty easy to create and update. If and when you do need to print it, um, they're fairly inexpensive, right? You can just go to, to your local print store and print 20 or, or 10. You don't have to print 500 or 1,000. They can be sent electronically, right? And they're a great tool to use as follow-up. Thank you for talking to me. Attached is my capability statement. And, and once your business grows, right? Because once your house is in order, you're able to grow and scale. And isn't that what this is all about is to grow your companies, to scale them and then to, to sell them or to pass them on and have a legacy company uh, for your kids or, or, or your family members, right? So when you grow, then eventually you can have capability statements by either service sectors or by industry. First part of our puzzle piece, identity. All righty, your identity. So a couple of things in regards to your company's identity. And here's a, a before and after of a capability statement um, that we did for Greg, our good friend at Honesty Construction Group. So company information we're talking about contact information yes i know i've said that about eight times already um your cage code your duns number as well as your certifications right so you can see right there people read from left to right in a z formation first thing on the left you know it's honesty construction group and it's great there you've got your cage code and your duns number and then, and then his, his personal certifications and his business certifications. So we're gonna show you quite a few different examples of capability statements, just to show you uh, the different depth and breadth of them and how they need to mirror your company's brand, right? So if your, if your company colors are purple and blue and gray, then don't send somebody a capability statement with orange and yellow and pink, right? Um, your DUNS number, how do I get a DUNS number? Well, Susan's gonna put in the chat, there's a website to go to get a free DUNS number. All righty, so you have to have a DUNS number. All righty, and if they call and try to upsell you, say, nope, I just need it for government contracting. Thanks, but no thanks, all righty. Um, so this is like a, a, a credit report for your company. You can't be everything to everyone. All righty, so focus on your company's strengths. Think about when we asked you to put your company information in the chat, those services, right? We've all sat there that people are like, what do you do? Well, what do you need? Well, what do you do? Well, what do you need? No, this isn't like a first date where it's awkward. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? I don't care. Where do you want to eat? No, 
Be specific. These are the things that I do really well. You cannot be after, I mean, you can't be all things to everyone and you can't go after every bid. So you need to be very strategic, right? That goes back to your business focus and your business model and your business goals. What are the areas of my company that I want to grow in? What are the most profitable areas? Hey, if they're profitable, guess what? Keep doing that. If it's not profitable, stop, right? Or tweak or figure it out, okay? So be very focused on what your company does. And with that, it's going to help you. And our next puzzle piece is communicate your services, your services and capability. Here's our good friend, Dwight. What does Dwight do? Well, I'll tell you what Dwight does. Dwight does engineering, consulting, and project management. Boom, one, two, three, right? And within those, these are his services, right? So construction management, inspection, painting, and concrete, right? So com concise and compelling, and then your services, you can list all sorts of other things. So once you know and have your focus, then you can go and determine what your NIGP codes are and your NAICS codes. Susan's going to drop those links in the chat here. And these are codes that the Houston Independent School District, as well as all of those other opportunities that RFP School Watch can provide for you, they do it off of these codes. They don't do it off of, I need paint, I need concrete, I need cables, I need pens. Everything is driven by either NAIX codes or NIGP codes. So you need to know what your codes are. So you can look at those commodity codes and have conversations about the types of products and services that you can provide. All right, so this is what the website looks like for the NAICS codes. Um, so you can put in keyword searches um, for there, as well as um, your NIGP codes. So here's our good friend, Chef Yo. And as you can see with her and Dwight, we just have their codes. But you've got to have somewhere in a cheat sheet in Microsoft Word or somewhere that you know what those are. Because if you just start rattling off, well, I do, you know, you know, 375, 30, and they're like, oh, what's that? Oh, I don't know. Julian Susan told me to put that code on my capabilities thing. You need to know that that's cakes, cookies, and pastries, right? So know what codes are on your capability statement. Also, when you, you know, you're setting up um, with RFP School Watch, they're going to ask you to put in your code so they can send you opportunities based on those codes. When you set up your vendor profile in IonWave with the Houston Independent School District, you need to know your codes. So guess what? If you have your capability statement and your codes are there, you can just look in one place and you've got it. You're getting your house in order. All righty. Also make sure to match the scopes of, of work to your codes, all right? And you'll see that in, in, the, in the opportunity. Susan's gonna put in the NIGP codes as, as well in the chat. So this is where you go to find your um, NIGP codes to, to list. If you have any questions about any of these codes, um, yeah, as Susan, she's a good numbers gal. I'm the marketing gal. She's the numbers gal. You're seeing a trend here. This is why we work so well together. All righty. Operations. These are items specific to your company's operations. So that could be, for example, your certifications, right? So here, Quentin has his certifications. He is hub certified, city of Houston certification and Metro. Guess what? HISD accepts City of Houston certifications. Whoop, whoop. So Quentin's ready. Or he's ready to do work with HISD. He's ready to go. Here's um, our friends at MWA Architects, and they have their certifications listed there. And then they also have the, the different school districts that they do work with. So if you've done work with any sort of educational entity, whether that's a private school, a university or another school district, make sure to put that on your capability statement, all right? Like I said, we're showing you all these different examples so you can get a flavor of, of different ways that, that you can um, put your capability statement. All righty, so what other certifications should you put on your capability statement that HISD accepts? Well, here's the M MWBE program FAQ website. 
They accept the city of Houston. They accept HMSDC, which is the Houston Minority Supplier Diversity Council. And they also accept the Women's Business Enterprise Alliance. So it accepts the city of Houston certifications, the minority certification, as well as the women um, certification. If you have any questions about the MWBE program within Houston Independent School District, make sure to reach out to Yesenia and their team. They will help you any way that they can. Why you? Why, why your company and why you? You've got to be able to articulate this through a value proposition. Alrighty, so happy tea me. I'm sorry, happy me tea. Um, they've got a couple different sentences here that communicate their value proposition. As well as here, here's tough equipment and supplies. Um, we had a gentleman ask about landscaping. So here's an example of, of a supplier that provides landscaping equipment, but you can kind of get, get the gist of it. Now, one of his big value propositions was that he had an actual storefront so people could go in and see his equipment. So we included a photo there. So take some time. Maybe this is something that you put on your action plan. Maybe not next week, but maybe for next quarter. So we're moving into that next box. Is come up with your value proposition. What does your business do? What are the benefits and advantages that you provide? I love doing value propositions and we could do a whole session on value propositions. Renee's dad in her head too, right? Maybe we, me, Renee and Susan could do one. Um, so where do you start? So I'm gonna, um, on this slide, I'm just gonna go to a few of these questions to kind of help get, get the wheels going, right? One thing that happily surprises people about my business is, We'll start thinking about that. What, what is something that you did for a client or a customer? And they were like, oh my gosh, you are so awesome, right? And it surprised them. They were like, wow, I got this. I wasn't expecting that. Um, once a client works with me, they discover blank. When they hire me or when they hire my team for blank, in addition, they get this. That's called added value. That's huge. My company goes above and beyond when it comes to. So these are some questions that you can help get you started because a value proposition can be sometimes difficult to write. Um, so try to avoid using buzzwords and industry jargon. And when you use these questions, that'll help navigate you into what makes you and your company unique. References, references, references. Even Renee put, put in there when we were talking about a banker. Well, if you're going to get references on a banker, guess what? People are going to get references on you. So put references on your capability statement. You're also going to need references when you fill out your HISD vendor profile on IonWave. You're also going to need references when you fill out your subcontractor packages. So if you've got them on your capability statement, then that's where you can go look to grab them. We encourage having three references at all times. Um, and then how do you get a reference? Well, you ask, right? Just ask someone, um, ask a happy client. You can even use a reference for a project that you're on right now because you had to start that project. You're in the middle of it. Absolutely, a current project can be a reference. You've got to let references know that you're using them, especially now that so many people have each other's personal cell phones. Why would I be getting a number of HIS from, from HISD? I don't have any kids in school. I don't have any kids that go to school at HISD. So when you let your reference know that you've listed them on your capability statement or that you put them as a reference when you set up your HISD vendor profile, it's a courtesy so they know and they've got a heads up. If they get an email from HISD or a phone call that they need to um, answer it and, and you would greatly appreciate that. Experience, and this is going to close out our, our section on capability statements, is experience. Uh, you've got to be able to communicate your company's experience. A quick and super powerful way to do that is by the numbers. You can see here at Lisa with Strac Homes. They've been in business for, for nine years. They've built eight new homes. They've renovated 178, and they've done seven commercial construction projects. Alrighty, so those are some numbers, um, types of things that you can use. Here's some additional information that you can include on your capability statement. And most importantly, I encourage you, if you don't already have it, so get your capability statement ready. 
And then if you don't have it on your website, go ahead and do so. So have the ability to download your capability statement on your website. And I'm gonna turn it over to Susan to talk about research. Her fingers are just going super fast over there. I am loving, loving this engagement in the chat. Um, fingers might be a little tired, but it is awesome. Thank you everyone that's asking questions, um, that is sharing information. Um, somebody asked for an insurance agency, somebody dropped some information. Um, this is great because it always helps to get a reference from someone. Okay, now you've got uh, you've got to kind of get your house in order. You've got your your financials, your risk management handled. You put your marketing piece together. Now you want to get some business, but where do you start? Well, research. The great thing about government contracting, the great thing about um, looking at opportunities for HISD, all you have to do is go look. Or if you sign up for RFP School Watch, hey, they send them right to your email address, which is also amazing. All right, so start with your top five. Uh, a lot of companies that come to us and and you know, oh, I want to I want to get started. This is my first question I ask him. What's your first? What is your top five target clients? I don't know. Well, you have to focus. You saw that slide earlier. If not, you're going to be scrambling all over the place and not getting any traction. So obviously, if you're here today, HISD is one of those top five. Maybe you have you have H, HCC, Metro. Or maybe it's a large corporation to so just have a depot. So start with that and then build your plan with those five. And then as you get that sort of up and running, go to the next five, but start with five. Visit and register as a vendor on HISD as well as the other four. You have to be in their system. They cannot award a contract at any point in time unless you are in their system. So might as well get that out of the way. How many people have gone to an expo and they walked around and the first thing that anyone says, have you registered on our supplier diversity website or have you registered as a vendor? The answer is gonna be, yes, I have. So let's move to the next step. So HISD has a wonderful website full of information. So Julie is going to drop this link in the chat. This is the purchasing service website. Uh, HISD uses an online system for bids. So you would need to be registered on this site. And this is the ion wave. And you may be registered on ion wave with another entity. You need to make sure you are registered on the HISD ion wave site. Very noticeable HISD seals in the background. Um, so get all of that information in place. This is another place. This is where you're going to go to respond to RFPs. And we keep throwing that word around. We are going to walk through an RFP in December, but that's a request for proposal. So this is the welcome page. Just welcome, you know, HISD. You know that you're on the right side. Um, this is their purchasing service. Um, it's going to give you some helpful hints. This is going to give you some information that you need to be successful in responding. Here is your uh, preliminary contact information. 
we're really big on supplying contact information. And make sure that you are using an email address of either the owner or the generic marketing or bids at whatever your company is. Now, the reason I say that is you don't know how many times we've had to go in and try and figure out what a password was because the person who signed everything up is no longer there. That email address is not active. And that's for any vendor registration. That is also for your business social media. That is also for your hub if you're, or any certifications. You need a generic email address and you also need a spreadsheet with all of that information. You're going to be updating this information a lot every year, anytime you've added additional services. Um, there is a newsletter that HISD sends out that has updated information on uh, bid opportunities. This will give you all of the information that you need, write to your email, read an email, find out what's going on with HISD, it's the bond newsletter. So Julie is also dropping a link into the chat of that. I would go ahead, if you're not signed up, go ahead and get signed up. All right, so let's go back to those top five. We've got some information on HISD. There's some questions that you need to research on those top five. Who are the buyers? What do they buy? Who is the buyer that buys my service? When are they purchasing this goods or service? If you've done any business with the uh, school, the K-12, you know that there is a lot of construction that goes on during the summer, school's out. But you also know that they need other goods and services during the school year while there are students in the class. So find out that cycle so that you know when to target and obviously, if you're in the construction industry, you don't want to target HISD during the summer. Construction's already in progress. Um, and another question to ask is the why. Why do you want to do business with them? Maybe you have students in HISD. Maybe you went to an HISD school. What is your why on why you want to do business with them? That's a personal question you need to ask, ask yourself and know that answer. Because that's an important part of your win themes. It's an important part of how you're going to market to them. What is your why? And it is not just because you want a contract. So let's start with those, those who's and the what's. So HISD actually lists their buyers on their website. You can go there and you can do a search and find out information that you need to know. And they give you the who. There's their directory. Now don't start just calling them randomly and then getting upset when they don't respond. Uh, these are people, they've got busy, busy lives, um, but send them a capability statement. I always tell companies be patiently persistent. You wanna make sure you stay in touch but you also don't want to uh, be that stalker person that is constantly contacting them. All right, so Julie is going to post these links. Um, oh, Julie has already posted these links. 
All right, so now let's talk about researching other opportunities. So the when and the why. When do they buy your goods or service? And why do you want to do business with them? So here we have on HISD's website, a list of current bids. So you can go there and you can open those up. Great educational experience. If you've never ever looked at um, a bid, um, if you've always subcontract, this is a good information for you to kind of find out what you're going to need. So we have everything that is listed as of yesterday. Um, so then when you open up um, the opportunity, it's going to ask you for <laughs> your contact information. They want to know who's opened that bid. They're trying to keep a track of who's opening the bid um, to get an understanding of, of people's interest. Um, if you don't have anyone open the bid, then maybe you need to revamp some things. Um, so once you get everything open, use your information. This is where you're going to download all of the documents and read them, all of the attachments. Somebody asked about the MWBE. Do you have to be an MWBE to do business with HISD? No, you do not have to be an MWBE to do business with HISD. However, if there is an MWBE goal, you need to meet that goal. All right, so we are winding up. Ooh, we have nine minutes. All right, so um, our session sponsor, we want to thank RFP School Watch. So Gary or Renee, do y'all have any closing remarks you wanna give? Uh, this is Gary. Um, <clears throat> the thing that I would, and I think you've covered it, but you know, in working with companies for the last 20 years and having them win business, they sometimes ask me, what does it take to win? A bit, and um, the you know all of what you have provided today is very useful information. But fundamentally, I would encourage companies to not chase bids that are not in your sweet spot. There's enough bids out there, as I say. We we send out over ten thousand notices to our customers daily all over the country. So uh, you want to go after bids that you know in your heart of hearts that you have a solution for. So don't chase bids that are one off or, or in the hope that you might get something. Also, when answering the questions in a bid, respond wherever you can in the affirmative, and that will get you higher scores. Uh, a lot of people want to be creative at that point, but the time to be creative in providing solutions to bid opportunities is after you're on the playing field. So initially, try and answer as much as you can in the affirmative to the questions that are provided. That will get you higher scoring. The other thing is don't chase things so that you are able to always provide uh, a creative solution to what they're looking for and why specifically they should use your company. So that's a little coaching on on how to win bids, um, and it works. Uh, we have clients that, that have been with us for 20 years that have um, built quite a, a repertoire of winning bids uh, throughout their territories uh, and have dedicated to it. So the, the other thing, coaching, and I'll finish up quickly, is that uh, it does take a commitment uh, as uh, Julie and Susan said in the beginning, to go after bids which actually have money allocated it. So you know someone is going to get that contract. Someone is going to get that money, those monies, and it might as well be you. So, But it, it does take a commitment to follow sort of the rules of the game on how to win. And um, we're open here at RFP School Watch to give you any kind of coaching on how to win bids. Uh, and just uh, reach out to us and we'd be glad to help you uh, uh, look at what it takes for your company to win bids. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, so Renee, you wanna do a real quick 
wrap up. Very yeah, quick. no, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Julie, for inviting us in to do this. This is so important. And so many things that you said today, especially the cap capability statement. I call that when I work with some clients, I always say first thing we're going to do before we even look at bids is we are going to look at what other companies like you do and how you stand out. And we're going to make an I love us statement and really show where we are better than everyone around us. And then we start adding all that capability statement stuff. And so then when we get to the point of filling out the bids, it's mostly there. That's 90% of what goes in it other than the pricing stuff, which changes. I mean, that that's the meat of it that changes every time. There's no real way to, to um, create that and have that saved. Um, we here at RFP School Watch really, really love uh, what we do. We really love to tell people how much business is out there and how much is really meant for small businesses like many of you guys are and don't be afraid of it it really is not that uh difficult once you get your feet under you and you understand what the rules are the rules aren't made to be confusing they're made to be so that they can um grade let's say and give everybody an equal footing and they really are able to pick out the right person for these. So once you understand that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy go. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Like I was telling everybody, I'm on LinkedIn. You can add me, I'm under Renee Farias. You can also go on to our website. And if you go ahead and register on our website, we'll send you some samples of bids. You can let us know what areas you're interested in, whether you're interested in all of the US, in just a state or two, or the US and Canada. And we'll send you some free samples and let you see how it works. And how they come directly to your email. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you. So everyone, I hope you have your action plan together, um, which includes you're going to sign up for the HISD weekly newsletter if you haven't gotten uh, that done yet. We're going to drop a link into our survey. Um, we would greatly appreciate you filling out that survey. It's important to all of us that we understand what we can use to improve, what additional um, seminars you would like to hear, and what information you're going to start using right away. Follow HISD on Twitter. Um, and for the survey, we are actually doing something special we've not done before. All of those that complete the survey and have their contact information will be in a drawing for a free capability statement. One person will win a free capability statement, a $400 value. So here are some additional action items. We're going to turn it over to Yesenia to close us out. Julie's dropping our contact information in the chat. All right, Yusinia. Yes, thank you everybody for attending. Um, thank you, Susan and Julie for hosting this wonderful workshop and to our sponsor, RFP School Watch. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody in December for the next workshop. Thank you. Thank you. And Julie and I are actually doing a capabilities workshop on August the 26th. We're very excited. And Yesenia uh, mentioned us on, on December the 8th. And so that's that's our next session with Houston Independent School District, as well as RFP School Watch. And we're going to be going through an actual HISD proposal, chunk by chunk. And, and like Renee said, we're going to be dissecting it in in going over errors that people commonly. commonly make that might cost you the contract and going over those words that might be a little confusing and going over the sections and saying, like Gary said, don't get creative. This is what they want. Color inside the lines. Um, 
So we hope that everyone has enjoyed our time together today. We so much appreciate you taking a chunk out of your Wednesday to spend 90 minutes with us and take care of yourself and most importantly, take care of each other. And we will see everyone soon. Very soon, I hope.